Good evening and welcome to Course in Miracles. We're on chapter 14. Uh, the heading of this chapter is Teaching for Truth. So it's really saying, teaches for God. The function behind teaching is that we teach that which we most want to learn. But if you follow the Holy Spirit's curriculum, and bearing in mind that the best way to understand Holy Spirit is God's Holy Spirit that is in our mind. In other words, God's Holy Spirit that has entered the dreaming Son of God's mind. And, and, and if, if the Holy Spirit's in God's dreaming Son's mind, then and the Son has split himself up, fractured himself into billions of thoughts in form spirit, spirits, because God's Son is a spirit, so he's split himself up into nine septillion spirits. Every time he split himself up, then a part of that which is the voice for God, God's Holy Spirit in the Son's spirit, is then in every single fracture too. And the best way to, to practically look at what the Holy Spirit is, is the Holy Spirit being the essence of God, God, essence of God's Spirit in our mind that has wholly retained its holiness, its purity, is therefore the memory of what we really are in God. We live and move in God. And so it's the reminder of what we are in the Son of God's mind and in all the fractured activities of the mind. And it is given us by God in order to, for us to return to the realization that we live and move in God, we never leave, but we're just dreaming we have. And there's a way... There's a sequence of events that each one of us takes to return to that full memory. So at first, it's just a little reminder, a call. But after a while, that memory becomes clear as the driving force behind our movements until it becomes the very essence of our own self-recognition recognition of ourself as the dreamer and the minute we recognize we're the dreamer we're at we're at that first vantage movement point of observer and what are we observing we're observing the activity of our dream and we know that it's the ego that goes searching for happiness enlightenment because it wants the permanence and security of happiness it's what we all seek we seek for happiness but not just happiness we want the permanence and therefore the security of having permanent happiness. And the minute we realize the activity is observer observing itself, the mind observing the, act, it, the activities of the mind, the minute that realization comes, it takes a holy instant, the holy instant, and the, the activities lose their meaning. And the son becomes aware of himself being awareness of itself. What is mind? Mind is pure awareness. And so there's a way to get to that moment of oh, holy instant. And so let's, let's start with the introduction, which is a very gentle way to say, wake up. So this is Holy Spirit talking to the observer, the dreamer, observing itself as an activity in the dream. and then going one step further inwards, lighter, to addressing the observer, the dreamer itself. And it starts off by saying, yes, you are blessed indeed. Because by now, having read up until chapter 13, you start to realize, oh my goodness, I'm dreaming. I'm responsible for all of this. I've been taking my guilt and projecting it onto my brother. And yet if I choose to see my brother guiltless, I'll recognize I am and in that recognition, there's that moment of clarity. Oh, my God, thank goodness, God, for your Holy Spirit that comes to remind me of what I really am. And therefore, I now recognize I'm blessed. And so that must be the, the, the conclusion of the previous chapter. Wow. Okay. I'm dreaming. 
then if I no longer blame my brother, I see myself as blameless and I, I release the guilt which has bound me and prevented me from knowing myself as the happiness I've always sought. And then he says, yet in this world, you don't know it. Because if you knew it, you know, um, including all the bliss bunnies that always seem to be in bliss, if you're truly happy, why are you following a path? If you're happy, there's no path. You are the path, you, and you're there already because you're happy. So clearly you're not happy. So look deep inside and admit to yourself. You don't have to admit to anyone. Am I really happy? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you don't know it because you are blessed. You cannot, if, you live, if you live and move and abide in God and you're not aware that you're happy, then you don't really realize what you are and what God is. So in this world, you don't really know it. While you, while you think you're a body or body-mind, you don't know it. But you have the means for learning it and seeing it quite clearly. Be thyself knowingly, seeing it clearly. The Holy Spirit. So when I say the Holy Spirit, silently say to yourself, the memory of God, the memory of God. The Holy Spirit uses logic. The logic, the memory of God is logical. As easily and as well as does the ego. Ego can be very logical, except that the ego's conclusions, okay, are insane. And the Holy Spirit's conclusions aren't insane. The ego takes you to a, a, through a naturally logical process, but the end result is madness. We've all looked upon this world and gone, doesn't make any sense. Either God is absolutely cruel, insane, wicked sense of humor, you know, nasty, or just neglectful, and lets all these horrible things happen, which means uh, there's something wrong with him. I mean, how he created the devil, there's a devil, part of him becomes Satan tempts us into damnation or there's another way to look at this and that is that i'm dreaming and i've dreamt the whole damn thing up including the idea of what god is an objectified idea and hence henceforth since i then that idea becomes solid in my own understanding therefore it becomes my new belief that belief just leads me to unhappiness and now i I spend my whole life trying to appease God. And, and what's the con consequence of trying to appease God? I start appeasing my fractured guilt, my fractured, fractured selves, because I feel guilty. I portion the guilt onto them. And how do I, how can I be happy if I hold everybody responsible for my unhappiness? And so both Holy Spirit and, 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 and the ego take a direction exactly opposite, pointing us clearly to heaven as the ego points to darkness and death. Because what's the final conclusion to the world of materialism, the world of the, the material concept that everything is matter and we are matter experiencing matter takes us to the final conclusion. Well, then matter dies. And then why would anything matter if the conclusion of this matter is that it doesn't matter because you die? So there has to be a... a ooh, it must be a better way. And so we've lived our whole lives, whether we believe in, in materiality or not, the, the, the scientific belief in the material, material is real, everything else is illusion. We've, we've lived our lives that way, even if we've had other beliefs about what God is, but we've acted in a materialistic belief. We have followed much of the ego's logic, and that's evident. And we have seen its logical conclusions that no matter what we think we are, it always ends up with we're going to die. And, and how often do we appropriate our physical, psychological, spiritual, metaphysical concepts into believing what we are? And so, how often do we say, I am a doctor, or I'm a CEO, or I'm a psychotherapist, or I'm a businessman, or I'm a business coach, or I'm a pharmacist, policeman? No, you're not that. That's, that's, an, that's a function of what you do. That's a, 
a, a title given to the what you do. What you do is not what you are. But if you then follow the logical conclusion, having and being are one, both for the ego and for Holy Spirit. So then having and being, so if I have a life of doing and doing is having, having is being, no wonder the ego comes to the conclusion that I am this. And how does it feel when I am this, but no one recognizes you for it? You want to get angry. You want to prove, you want to show it. You want to prove to yourself and others, but I am, I am a doctor. Why don't you believe I'm a doctor? Because deep inside within you, you have a sense of unworthiness. And then if people don't see your self-ascribed identification, what you've bought into, you get angry, you get defensive, and you attack. And yet, if you follow the logical outcome of spirit, Holy Spirit, I am a spirit. I'm not a body. I am free. I'm still as God created me. I just dreamt a dream that never happened, but in time, but not in eternity. And therefore, I am still as God created me. And therefore, I am the essence of what I am is divine. It's the extension of the essence of God. And that which I think I am, feel, touch, think is not true. Okay. Then when feelings, thoughts, projections arise in my awareness, I can let it go because I'm no longer attached to the outcome of my identity. And that is true liberation. And having them, we realize that they cannot be seen except in illusions. For there alone, their seeming clearness seems to be clearly seen. I'm a I'm doctor, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this. And we ascribe labels to everything. Let us now turn away from all these labels and beliefs. Let's empty the cup and follow the simple logic by which the Holy Spirit teaches the simple conclusion that speaks for truth and only truth. So there's a whole nother way. So when we say the Holy Spirit, I'm burdened with this. I'm burdened with this challenge. I'm burdened with this hurt, pain, suffering, ideas. Show me another way to see this. What we're really saying to the Holy Spirit is, teach us the simple conclusion that speaks for truth and only truth. Because we're done with the lies of the illusions of the ego. We're done. We're done with the ego's logical conclusions that actually are not logical and make no sense unless God is cruel and evil and, and, and forgetful and abandoned and has abandoned us. And you know what? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. A child dies. Oh, it's God wants them. Oh, someone's murdered. Oh, God, God scripted it. Um, you know, and just, oh, I'm suffering. God scripted my life that way. That person has it all. This, this person is not. That's just, that's the ego's logical conclusion. And then we, we can't answer it. So we say, well, it's not for our mind. It's for God's mind. Something inside us says, Heaven, as the ego points to darkness and to death, can't be heaven. So let's truly go and find another way. So I'll jump straight into the conditions of learning. It's a short section, and then we'll, we'll pause after this and take a break. Again, remember, again, remind you, this is, you're a teacher for God. You, and the teacher for God is anyone that has answered the call. Because we're always teaching and we're always learning. And true learning is the we're not actually learning anything new. We're just remembering what we are. So we're actually unlearning or disrobing and getting rid of the veils, and getting rid of the obstacles to peace. So it's by shining, shining the light of Holy Spirit's awareness onto the filters, the ideas, the identities, the sin, the fear, the guilt that we've put in the way of the light, which is actually us. So it's learning is the recognition of our shared being. That's what... what the, the ultimate conclusion of learning is unlearning all the filters until we recognize ourself as the shared being with God, God, the extension of God. So let's look at the conditions for true learning, which is really unlearning everything we've learned before. And, and he says it very, very clearly in the first line. He says, if you are blessed and do not know it, <laughs> then you need to learn. It must be so. Because you are blessed. So let's look at why you don't. The knowledge is the knowledge is not taught. 
this is this is the truth because it can't be taught because how are we going to teach knowledge to that 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 would never comprehend what knowledge is so knowledge cannot be taught to a mind in body form but we can prepare it by its conditions must be acquired so we acquire the conditions for knowledge to make itself known as always having been in our awareness. Okay. Why? Because we threw them away. So the conditions must be acquired as if they'd been thrown away. You've thrown them away when you chose to believe in illusions, when you chose to believe that what you made is an actual fact true. And one of the conditions for learning what you made was true was to forget what you've always known. And so now learning seems like you're acquiring access or awareness of awareness. You're not actually acquiring it. You're just getting rid of the filters. So it's like a cloudy day that hides the sun. You're getting rid of the clouds until the sun is clear. And, and then you realize, oh, the sun's always been there. It just seems to be hidden by the cloud. You can learn to bless and cannot give what you have not. Okay. You can learn to bless and cannot give what you have not. So if you're blessing, then you must have it. If then you offer blessings, it must first have come to yourself. And you must also have accepted it as yours, for how else could you give it away? How can you offer something you don't have? How can you love unless you have love? Have you ever wondered what in you loves? When there's that wonderful teaching, well, I've, I've heard it in Padre Pio. I also, heard, I also read it in the teachings of Meister Eckhart. And something Rupert Spira often says as well, and that is, it's a poem to God, and it says, God, you are the love with which I love thee. God, Father, you are the love with which I love thee. So it's not I love thee. You are the love with which I love thee. So you are the love with which I am. It's a beautiful saying. That is why miracles offer you. And this is the purpose of miracles. And remember, first and foremost, miracle is the shifting of the mind in seeing a new way, not just the physical demonstration of healing. This is why miracles offer you a testimony that you are blessed. Because if it's coming through you, it must be in you. If what you offer is complete forgiveness, you must have let guilt go. Accepting the atonement, the at one in other words, the knowing that you joined in God and abide in God for yourself and learning you are guiltless. And this for me, and I'll stop there for a second, was a great learning for me because miracles would happen through me. I, I recognized even as a young boy, I wasn't actually doing it. But you know, I would heal a bird or heal a wounded dog, a wounded dog or a cat or whatever. And, and this happened naturally as a small child. I would take something that was, and I would hold it and the broken wing would come, it would be fully restored. And I, I guess there was something in me that thought it was just magic or, but I, there was a deeper recognition that was working through me. And as I grew up and as I got older and, and, and these continued and well into my, my 30s, without me really realizing what was happening. And yet, whenever I needed help, they wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to heal myself. And I often used to be a little annoyed, if not a lot annoyed, if not really pissed off <laughs> at God and saying, you know, seriously, dude, you let, you know, I'm helping everyone else. I heal this one, I heal that. Blah. I get a migraine. I'm out for four days. I take you know, X amount of Myperdol and yes, it helps. But I'm still psh, not myself. I take an overdose of my myperdol, you know, because I just can't deal, you know, cluster headaches, migraine. How, why can't you just take it away from me? And it took me a long time, really. Well, it took me to get into the course to realize that it's because I didn't believe I deserved it. I believed I was good enough to be a conduit for God, but that I wasn't receiving it. I was just letting it flow through me. And, and so it was the recognition that it was in me that then allowed this body-mind individual 
I'm speaking of myself in the third person because of the awareness of what all, that I recognize this is worthy and it already exists within this seeming apparition, illusion, holographic um, delusion of a body mind. It must actually exist as the essence in it for it to be offered. And that was a great step in the awakening in recognition of the self I am. So, and, and this is now clear. And so there's no way I could be sharing any of this unless it was clear in my own as well. So it's not authentic for me. And I can't teach, I can't teach concept. I have to, I may teach with concepts, but I'm teaching from a place of recognizing it my as myself and, and i start to struggle for words because when the minute you move into that awareness of being awareness itself the words you realize that wonderful line of but you know words are but symbols twice removed the concessions that you're trying to allude to the awareness of being aware the minute you've opened your mouth it, it's just you may be pointing in the right direction but it's lost in translation. Of course, those that are ready will receive, but with total clarity. How can you learn what has been done for you, unknown to you? <laughs> it's been done for you, but it's unknown to you, unless what you do, unless you, what you, sorry, unless you do what you would have to do if it had been done for you. Let me read that whole sentence again. How could you learn what has been done for you? Unknown to you, unless you do what you have, what you would have do if it had been done for you. So how would you know you have it unless you're able to offer it and then it's done for you? A little bit of tongue twister there. Indirect proof is needed in a world made of denial and without direction. And so teachers for God, one of the greatest gifts you give yourself is as you offer blessings, offer clarity. What's, what's blessings? Clarity, a new way of seeing it. And that's a miracle, clarity of new vision. And then you witness to what appears to be your students, but really is your fractured selves. This is only you, the dreamer. First position, the I, which then recedes into the I am, and then the dissolving of any form of identity, is then shown you as you watch people lift from their struggles and their thoughts and their fears and their hurts and their pains and their idea of suffering, and they, they lift. And there's a joy that rises in you because it's why you do this. You want to serve the joy in all. But what's doing it? It's the joy in you serving the joy in all. And then that recognition comes. And that's the greatest gift of being in this beautiful position, this blessed position of being, of taking up the call to be a teacher for God. You will perceive the need of this if you realize that to deny is the decision not to know. And that is the condition of the world. And also a condition that a lot of spiritual people do. They go, they go down this path. And at a certain stage, they denounce and detach from the world because they see the cruelty. They believe themselves to be holy and connected and the dreamer or whatever, but they still see the dream as outside them and they want to denounce and deny the dream. And what is that? It's a decision not to know that what you look upon are fractures of yourself showing you the subconscious deep hidden guilt that you think you've transcended, but while you're still seeing it and denouncing it, you haven't fully forgiven. And that's why there's a lot of people that get quite deep into the course, years into it, and there comes that thing where the whole thing, the whole thing starts becoming tasteless. There's no point. It's the meaninglessness of it all. And they scramble because their identity is dissolving. And at that point where the ego suffers its second death, the first death of the ego is a recognition you're going to die. 
The second death of the ego is the recognition that the ego is dying. But life, which is what you are in essence, in essence, you are life, because in essence, you are the extension of God. That remains eternal and the identity dies. And it's a sad, difficult part for the ego. If you've never experienced it, you will. We all have. We all will. And it becomes, it's a very lonely time. It's the way you recognize you're there. It's lonely, even though you may surround it by people, maybe married children, kids. It's a lonely time because the ego is dying. The ego, the identity, ego identity. That's ego is identity. The identification with all those thoughts, beliefs that you've apportioned to yourself, identified with. It's dying. It dies. It dies. The death of self, small s. It's also taught in Christianity. It's taught in the Vandantas, the death of self, the death of the ego. It's, it's taught in, 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 in Sufism, um, the, uh, the Muslim mystic teachings. So in all the mainstream religions, Buddhism, Taoism, Vedanta, Christianity, there is the teachings of the death of self, the surrendering of self. So people that get a certain level, attain a certain level of self-awareness, their self-awareness is either ego identification or big self-awareness, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the top of the pyramid, is the self-actualization, the realizing of the divine essence of self. If you look at the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, they all allude to that, Papaji, they all are Muji, Rupert Spira, uh, Krishnamurti. I mean, what, a, what, a, what an amazing mind and I'm talking capital mind in a body mind identity, who just, he was, the, in my opinion, one of the introducers, you know, of true self inquiry to the Western world. True, he just beautiful way of going to the ultimate conclusion it's all mind and the body mind or the identification exists only in that which is mind and the minute thought subsides there's just awareness and the identity goes so yeah all the preludes to this course of records the logic of the world must therefore lead to nothing for its goal is nothing ego doesn't want you to come to any other conclusion than the conclusion that ultimately you're going to die the identity is going to die and your identity gets buried with you and therefore stays in the grave, which is why we have tombstones and we put down dates and, you know, and we can't help but say loving father, loving mother. Of course, they're all loving. No one's ever said this in this underneath this tombstone lies an arsehole. No one's ever said that. It's always in memory of my loving someone. If you decide to have and give and be, so to have and give is to be nothing except a dream. You must direct your thoughts into oblivion. Okay. So have, give, and be takes me to oblivion. Mm, don't like that idea. And if you have and give and are everything, and all of this has been denied, your thought system is closed off and wholly separated from the truth. So you have and you give and you are everything. But you've denied this. And so your thought system is cl cl closed off completely and separated from the truth. So then you don't know it. So you may as, not, may as well not have it. So then have given be nothing but a dream or have and give everything, but you don't remember it. And therefore you deny it while well, you're trapped. And that's the purpose of the ego. So you get access to the non-dual understanding, the simplicity of the non-dual understanding. Either, you, you know, either God is mad or you're dreaming. And it's as simple as it is. And therefore, if God isn't mad. God is love. You're dreaming. And therefore, you're part of love and you abide in love. But you deny it. So this is an insane world. And do not underestimate the extent of the ego's insanity. That's what the world is. There is no area of your perception that it hasn't touched. 
And that is what's made you self-doubt. Beat yourself up. Become a victim of the world you see. And try and appease other people. They're constantly trying to appease other people. And remember, you're not just appeasing strangers. That's the, that's the depth of madness. People that are trying to appease strangers are, in essence, prostituting themselves in the worst possible way. But the ego is very cl clever. It captures you in terms of sense of duty. And what is duty without unconditional love? Is it service? Duty without unconditional love is a burden. It's a sacrifice. And so there's no area of your perception that it has not touched. And your dream is sacred to you. This world is sacred to you. And the areas that are sacred to you, think of your relationships that you're so attached to. Children, parents, spouse, colleagues, bosses, community, tribes, country, and then finally the world. You know, but we don't go so far. We get into community, tribe, tribe meaning belief systems or little factions. And then we unite under those factions and attack the rest of the world. And so, and that becomes sacred to us and we'll defend it at all costs without even considering what we're defending. I mean, you may hate your sister, but what would you do if someone talks bad about it? You just get angry. No, only I'm allowed to. I'm a, only I'm allowed to talk about my sister, my mother, my brother, my father, whatever, my friend. That is why God placed the Holy Spirit in you. So God placed His memory in you, Holy Spirit, the memory of God in you, where you placed the dream. So you've dreamt this whole thing up, where you placed your, your activities. Of your mind, and God put, spoke the Holy Spirit, in, the voice for God. That's why it's such a beautiful way to explain Holy Spirit as the voice for God, the essence of God, the memory of God, the reminder of God, that which points the way to return to the knowing of yourself as you move and rest and abide in God, and God moves and rests and abides in you. From an ego perspective, seeing versus vision. Seeing is always out where your thoughts, where your thoughts wholly of you, were your thoughts wholly of you, the thought system you made would be forever dark because you've dreamt the dream of darkness. The reason the dream has got light or suns and stars, and because the very realizes the elements of suns and stars, the star, every sun is a star, is energy. And energy is light, and light is God. So the suns that light up the universe are the memories in form of God's Holy Spirit and give light to our otherwise darkened universe because we wouldn't see anything if there were no suns. And from every sun spits out planets. So the suns extend themselves unknowingly and yet the sun retains the light and yet how does the sun know its light it knows it because it it sheds its light it shines its light on on the planets around it so imagine you are the sun and those planets around you are your fractured beings how do you know that you're the light because you see them light up but until you become aware that you are light you don't know the light that lights up the planets is you just a little story the thoughts the mind of God's son projects or extends have all the power that he gives to them. So, so you've given all the power of God to them because God has given you the power. The thoughts he shares with God are beyond his belief, but those he made are his beliefs. So the real thoughts you share, the only thoughts you really have are the thoughts you have with God, which is the extending of love. That's your only function. But the ones you've made, the universe, forms, people, space, people, places, things, and events, that becomes your belief. And you believe they're real and you believe you are. And it is these and not the truth that he has chosen to defend and love. We love this, we love that, we love, love Jupiter. And of course, we give him all sorts of mystical qualities 
just rocks. The whole thing is just rocks, no matter how pretty, no matter how beautiful the star nebulas are, and it's all beautiful colors, and the whole thing is just floating rocks. Third rock from the sun, there's a whole lot of rocks running around thinking they're humans. It's all just pure light vibrating at a frequency that appears as matter, and quantum proves it. You go into the particle, particle within a particle, go deeper, deeper, deeper. There's nothing. Just all an illusion. And yet there's something which witnesses the breaking down to nothingness. And in that nothingness is the realization of everything. So everything we've actually chose to defend and love won't be taken away from you. Won't be taken away from them. But they can be given up by him, by you, for the source of their undoing is in him. So the source of the undoing of our illusion, source, God, God's Holy Spirit. And what are we? We are spirit. What is God? Spirit. So if God is holy, what is the extension of God? Holy Spirit. What are you? The extension of God. What are you? If you're the extension of God and God is spirit, what are you? God is spirit. You must be spirit. If God is holy, you must be holy spirit. So what's the memory of God in you? It's the reminder of what you are. It's the truth in you. You are the extension of God's Holy Spirit. And therefore, you are the essence of God's Holy Spirit. And therefore, you are Holy Spirit. Wow. Not an objectified being that stepped into you. The very essence of what you are is the essence of God. You are God's. Extension, extension of God, the extension of God's Holy Spirit. So where's God placed you in God? Where's God placed the memory of you in you, which is the extension of God? So simple. If you're willing to see a new, if you're willing to let go of the objectification and wait for a savior, who's saving you? The memory of what you really are is your salvation. Because your salvation, being the memory of what you are, gets rid of what you're not. There is nothing in the world to teach him that the logic of the world is totally insane and leads to nothing. Nothing in the world teaches you the logic of the world is but totally insane. Yet in you, in him who made this insane logic, there is one who knows it leads to nothing, for he knows everything. And the one that knows, we assign it the quality of God's Holy Spirit. Yet later in the course, and I'm sorry that I'm jumping the gun for you, it's you, it's all you, in your purest essence, the essential nature, the essential essence of what you are, is the essential essence of what God is. Any direction that, you, that would lead you to where the Holy Spirit leads you not, where your Holy Spirit leads you not, goes nowhere. Anything you deny that he knows to be true, you have denied yourself. Anything the Holy Spirit denies, okay, you deny. He knows to be true. You have denied yourself. And he must therefore teach you not to deny it. I'm not a body, I am free. Don't deny it. I'm not a body, I am free. I'm still as God created me. Don't deny it. Undoing is indirect as doing is. You were created only to create, neither to see nor do. And you think you see and you think you do, but you see and do nothing. These are all imaginations, imaginary activities in your dreams. These are but indirect expressions of the will to live, the will to be life itself, which has been blocked by the capricious and unholy womb of death, ego, and murder, ego, that your father does not share with you. Your father does not share your identity as a body, mind, ego with you. You have set yourself the task of sharing what cannot be shared, mad ideas and beliefs. And while you think it's possible to learn to do this, theological school or 
philosophical school or whatever school and philosophy, psychology, you think you're going to learn. You will not believe at all that it's possible to learn to do. Okay. So while you think you can learn the ways of the ego, you can't learn to undo the ways which aren't true and be shown another way. The Holy Spirit, the memory of God in you, the memory of God as the reminder that you are the extension of God, the reminder that you are the Holy Son of God, therefore must begin his teachings by showing you what you can never learn. His message is not indirect, but he must introduce the simple truth into a thought system, your thought system, which has become so twisted and so complex that you cannot see. It means nothing. He merely looks at its foundation and dismisses it. So, and that's the beginning of the course. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. Go within. Go within. Inquire. To whom does this address? Find, find the being. And all you'll find is no being. But beingness, the essence of the awareness of being aware. I am that I am. But you, who cannot undo what you have made, because you made it and you've believed into it, cannot see through it, because you've made it. You've made it in order to replace your memory of God. It deceives you because you chose to deceive yourself. But those who choose to be deceived will merely attract, attack direct approaches. So the direct path to self-inquiry, the ego says, don't go there. What are you doing? Oh, but I have these thoughts. To whom do the thoughts appear? They're my thoughts. I'm thinking them. You know. Okay. So those who choose to, to be deceived will merely attack direct approaches. Because they seem to, to encroach upon deception and strike at it. So the minute our, our body-mind identification starts getting inquired, we just go, no, that's nonsense. Absolutely not. It's non-dual nonsense. Let's go back to our old original belief because I'm not prepared to believe this. And so this, this curriculum really says inquire. Inquire. So, as in Abhita Vedanta, the path of self inquiry is the direct path. You can do the, the, the path of bhakti, um, which is devotion, and just sit and be silent. But then you would have chosen a different incarnation, physical. So, don't go and find another way. You hear, you have roles, responsibilities, and, and all your roles and responsibilities, if approached with unconditional love and serving your unconditional love, those serving of through your passionate nature, which is your talent in this world, by applying, I seek mercy, forgiveness, not sacrifice, applying it with mercy, with forgiveness in your heart, with gratitude in your heart, become the path to the self, only self reveal. Let's stop there and let, I'll take some questions before we continue. And now we do Course in Miracles, text chapter 14, teaching for the truth. Remember, this is all about preparing you for being a teacher that follows and walks in Jesus' footsteps. That's what he was trying to show us. When Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I believe it's a slight mistranslation. He was really saying, unless you believe what I'm telling you, in other words, believe me that this is true, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Of course, we've just twisted it into believing in, 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 in an external savior, which is um, a special son, God, you know, God's special son, which sacrificed his life for us. He's saying, no, 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 no. Believe me, what I tell you. Father abides in me, Father abides in you. What I can do, you can do. Greater things than I have done, you shall do. Believe me, and you'll know eternal life. You'll know 
when, when Jesus taught, you'll know eternal life. What he's really saying is, you'll know you are eternal life. So this section is called the happy learner. And that's, that doesn't make you smile. And you miss this course. And then this course becomes heavy. It's not meant to be. The only This course asks but one sacrifice. And that is the sacrificing of your identity. Get rid of your identity and know yourself. Be yourself knowingly as the love and light and the joy of God which is be happy because this, when you understand what you are, when you understand what your father is, you'll be happy. So be happy to go through these stages of, of, of the, rec the recognition of your I am, the recognition of your son of God, the guiltless son of God you are. But more importantly, for 2,000 years, give or take, two more thousand years, religious men, men, mostly men, sorry, ladies, but that's the way it was, um, have sought to know God and have sought to then share their understanding with others. And yet, as Lovingly as they may have tried to do it, and as they still do in, 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 in dogma and religion, unless they are happy, they carry with them and in them such a sense of separation because of their dualistic way of looking at things that deep inside them, there's still something which longs to know, and yet they want to teach as if they do. And it's not that they don't experience moments of sheer joy and elation and the celebration as the spirit touches them. Because of course, even if you're in duality and you love God, the spirit's going to touch you. But it doesn't stay because you don't recognize it's you. You think it's you're being touched and then it's gone. And then being touched. Once you recognize yourself as that which is God's Holy Spirit, then the recognition remains with you. And as ego then tries to tempt you to buy back into the identification of body-mind separation, you stop. You go, no thanks. And so he's calling us to happily join him and, and happily remember our joining has never not been there. The Holy Spirit needs a happy learner in whom his mission can be happily accomplished. In whom his mission can be happily accomplished. You who are steadfastly devoted to misery, <laughs> to suffering, to guilt, must first recognize that you are miserable and not happy. So just admit to yourself. And, 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 and that's a fact. Are any of us here on this course completely happy? Because we were, why would we be, if we were hope, totally happy, we'd know ourselves as that which is happiness itself. And that happiness itself is the joy and happiness of God. And therefore, we then know God because we know ourselves as the extension of God's love. So if we're not, and we're still doing the course and attending weeks after weeks of. Then, then let's just admit we're not. And so let's choose to be that which is happiness. Let's choose to be happy. The Holy Spirit cannot teach without this contrast. Because you only know what you are through the experience of what you don't want and what you're not. For you believe that misery is happy. How do we believe that misery is happiness? Well, because we keep pursuing it. And even to the point that we become a seeker and we identify with the seeker. Think, and then we make ourselves special, call ourselves spiritual. There's no label beyond I am. We'll stop. This can, has so confused you 
that you have undertaken to learn to do what you can never do. Think of self-help improvements, the myriads of coaching techniques, the philosophies, the psychologies. What are we trying to do? We, this world is bursting out with coaches. Coach, the world of coaching. Who coaches? But those that are searching for a better way to do things, a way to improve themselves. Who, who goes for coaching? Someone who wants to improve themselves. What do you want to improve? The identity, the qualities of the identity. And you want to find a way that that identity could be happier. So when people go for coaching, what is it they're looking for? They're looking for happiness. And who coaches them? Those that don't see the happiness. So they want to make the world happy. Which means if you're not seeing it, you're not recognizing it. Now, there's a lot of validity behind coaching. Because if it lifts the burden of the identification with doing to a lighter identification of being, then coaching is so valid because it's aligning with this curriculum. But if the coach doesn't realize that having and being is the same thing, then the coach has missed it. And he's going to impart upon his student the fact that you can improve the identity. You don't improve the identity. You get rid of the notion that there is any identity. The ID of an entity. The identity. It's an entity. Identity. And so a happy learner, unless he recognizes happiness is the very essence of God as he shared being, misses it and is trapped in the I can help you. I can't help you. I'm not helping you. The best all I can do is be a voice for the voice for God. And having experienced the letting go of my identity, share with you a way, a possible way, in which you can apply what I apply to my life into your own, in your own way. The minute I stay steadfast, stick to steadfast curriculum, which work for me won't necessarily work for you. And believing that it's the only way because it worked for me, I'm going to impose it on you. And then you're back into dogma, no different to religion. So this is so confusing that you've undertaken to learn to do what you can never do. You think that you can attain something, you can become enlightened. Enlightenment is not something you become. Enlightenment is the recognition of the self, the holy self, whose essential nature is the exact same essential nature as that which created it. So the very essence of the self is the exact essence of that which created us, God. So... If God's essence is the same as my essence, then I share my essence with God. God is source, and I'm the extension. And that recognition is what we call enlightenment. And that's what we're all really searching for. In the myriads of things that we do in this world, in terms of education, equipping ourselves, searching for whatever we search to accumulate, because we're looking to be secure in our identity. And the Holy Spirit is saying, your security is not in your identity. Your security is in the recognition of what you are, not in what you identify with. And so you've undertaken to learn to do what you can never do, believing that unless you learn it, you will not be happy. 
and take it to someone who's gone and equipped himself with 30 years of education. All it took was get, well, never mind school, then in that case, it's 40 years of education. Um, just got me to the point where I realized I know nothing. And so show me another way to see it. You do not realize that the foundation on which this most particular learning goal depends means absolutely nothing because everything we learn leads us to the realization that we don't only know anything. Yet, however, learning becomes a way of exposing the ego line because it finally gets us to the point where we go, there must be another way to see this. Show me. Let me get myself out of the way. So very often learning, although it doesn't teach us anything and means absolutely nothing, gets us to realize that it means nothing. And in that case, learning is so beneficial. And that's why I never criticize anybody's path because the path itself will expose there is no path. Yet it may make sense to you. And it does. And that's why we learn. Have faith in nothing. And you will find the treasure that you seek. It's a bit of a... Hang a second. So if we have faith in nothing, we'll find the treasure we seek. It always reminds me of Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, where he, the kid goes off to find himself. And after his journey, he ends up sitting under the little tree, which he always sat in. He scratches at something glistening in the grass. And... And there's a whole treasure trove. He went looking for his fortune. It was right underneath it, which is symbolic. It's always in you. Yet you will add another burden to your already burdened mind because it just fills your brain with all sorts of concepts and ideas. And I remember as I got into metaphysical you know, understanding and, and, and Jungian psychology, and of course, Freud was involved too, and Nietzsche, how I started to unravel the... Val's typography of human behavior, never mind Maslow. And if you go deeper into Maslow's stuff, not just the marketing material, you start to realize Maslow was looking at the non-duality too. So beyond self-actualization, Maslow explained self-realization. But it took a, a master's degree for me to realize that what I thought I knew, I didn't. <laughs> going to a master's just to realize you master nothing. You will believe that nothing is of value and then will and then and will value it. And yeah, it, it teases us so beautifully. A little piece of glass, diamonds, or whatever we we that glistens, a speck of dust in the form of a house, a body in the form of something beautiful or a war, something ugly, or one to you. It will become one to you. For if you value one thing made of nothing, made of space-time appearing as matter, and quantum proves that all matter ultimately is a tiny particle bouncing around so fast that it seems real. And when you even analyze that particle, there's nothing there. I heard this wonderful explanation. An atom is like a tennis ball vibrating so fast that it appears as an entire football stadium. And yet, if you slow that atom down that you could grab it, that little tennis ball, you'd realize there's no stadium. And then as you try to squeeze on the, on, the, on the tennis ball, you'd realize there's nothing there. So if you value one thing made of nothing, you have believed that nothing can be precious. And that's, what, and that's when you start to feel, oh, what's the point of all of this? You start to feel depressed and the sadness comes in and the loneliness comes in. And the guilt rises to the surface because the ego starts to die. And that you can learn how to make the untrue true, but now that you've seen that it's all untrue, how do you now give any meaning and truth to anything that is meaningless? And that becomes a really tough time 
in, in the transition to the awakened mind because the ego realizes it's dying and then tries to get you back into sensation, feeling, pain, blame, guilt. And, and very often students get so far and no more and they go, this is just too painful. And they say things like ignorance was bliss. Well, if it was, you would have stayed there. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is just denial. The Holy Spirit seeing where you are, where you think you are, but knowing you are elsewhere and realizing you've never left the kingdom before you, because you are the kingdom, begins his lesson in simplicity with the fundamental teaching that truth is true. Only truth is true. You mean, isn't this true? Well, in duality, two things appear to be true, but neither are. This is the hardest lesson you'll ever learn. And in the end, the only one. Simplicity is very difficult for twisted minds. You know, you know like, I love that line. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Sophistication is always so simple. So clear, so concise, so minimalistic. I think it was, uh, I could be wrong. It was Michelangelo that said it, but I remember reading it in Le Corbusier's architectural manual. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Consider all the distortions you have made of nothing. All the strange forms and feelings, empaths, and actions, doers, and reactions, defensiveness, that you have woven out of, woven out of. Nothing is so alien to you as the simple truth. How could it possibly be that I'm dreaming? And nothing are you less inclined to listen to. What do you mean this world is an illusion? That feels real. This is real, this is, this is true, yeah? The contrast between what is true and what is not is perfectly apparent. Yet you do not see it. Every night you go to dream, you go to bed, you dream often. It seems real while you're in your dream. Sometimes your nightmares bother you that you talk about it and go and buy books on what are the symbology of dreams? What does it mean? Some dreams haunt you for years later, and yet you dreamt it. And while you were dreaming, it was so real, so solid. And then you wake up and you go, oh, no, that was a dream. This can't possibly be. And yet life mirrors truth as above, so below. And so the whole thing is given us in the flower, the Fibonacci of a flower, the sacred geometry of everything, quantum. Solgafredo, the, 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 the frequency notes, 0.618 pi, that take us to the frequency of realizing resonance is just vibration. And sound is just vibration. And light is just vibration. And color is just vibration. All alluding and pointing to the same thing. And darkness has no particle. Light is particle. Darkness is the absence of light. Everything alludes to it. And yet we still want to hang on to the reality of solidity. And, and even though this solidity, this body-mind identity is going to die, and yet we accumulate and plan for the inevitable, oblivion. The simple and the obvious are not apparent to those who would make palaces and royal robes of nothing, believing they are kings, with golden crowns because of it. Putting a crown on your head doesn't make you a king. All this the Holy Spirit sees and teaches simply that all of this is not true. To those, to, to those unhappy learners who would teach themselves nothing and put titles like doctor in front of their name, professor, look at me, I have a doctorate delude themselves into believing that it is nothing. The Holy Spirit says with steadfast fast quietness, the truth is true. 
Nothing else matters. Nothing else is real. And everything beside it is not there. And he says, take, this is, he's, ask, he's asking you. Holy Spirit, Christ asking you. Let me, give it to me. Let me make the one distinction for you that you cannot make, but need to learn. Really, undoing. Your faith in nothing in this world of space-time is deceiving you. You believe it's true as you see it. You're fascinated. The Hubble telescope. What else is it going to find? Another world. Another planet that's similar to, oh, we're looking for another planet that's similar to Earth. Why? Why don't we focus on this one make this one work? <laughs> we just want another planet and we're going to go fight over its mineral life. Offer your faith to me and I will place it gently in the holy place where it belongs. In the awareness of being aware that you've never left the kingdom. You'll find no deception there. Only, but only the simple truth. And you will love it because you'll understand it. Not conceptualize it. Not believe it. No belief. No B lie F lie. No lies. No concepts. No faith required. When you understand, you understand. You only have faith and belief. And belief is a, is, a, is, a, is, a sub, is a better substitute than hope. And it doesn't come close to knowing. Because when you know, you know. And you can only know once you've understood. And the peace of God, which transcends an un understanding into the knowing of oneself, is the following, the, the one instruction Jesus gave us. And it's the one instruction we should follow because Jesus demonstrated beyond superior intellect and understanding and knowing because he demonstrated a most inconceivable idea at the time and still that one could be nailed to a cross, be killed, died. And three days later, resurrect a body that had never been done before and not just stop there. You could take that body and make it disappear. In other words, it's not real. And yet, the memory of him is retained in, our, in everyone's mind. Everyone in this world has heard of Jesus. May not believe him, may not have faith in him, but they've all heard of him. And even other religions, Buddhism talks of Jesus often. Many scrolls in Ladakh. Jesus traveled to Ladakh. So much written about him there. And the Hindu faith re, 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 talk of Jesus all the time, and Mother Mary for that matter. And the Muslim faith revere Jesus. There's so much in the Quran of Jesus. Christianity, of course, filled with them. Did anyone really grasp it? The Vendantic, yes. Ramana Maharshi mentioned Jesus often. Krishnamurti mentioned Jesus often. Papaji mentioned him all the time. Muji talks about him all the time. Because the minute he transcended physicality and became the awake part of the mind, the Christ, he was immediately accessible. All fractured minds. Why? Because all fractured minds are the activity of the dreamer's mind. And as Jesus recognized himself as the dreamer, the son of God, and awoken to his shared being with God, it was immediately accessible to all nine septillion fractured beings, or eight billion of us on this planet. Like you, not more special than you. Like you, the Holy Spirit did not make truth. Like God, he knows it to be true because he's the messenger. He brings the light of truth into your dream of darkness and lets it shine on you, on your mind. And as it shines on your brother 
as it shines on your brothers, see it. Because then you know your brothers are reflections, mirrors of yourself. And realizing that this light is not what you made, they see it more, in, so they see it in you more than you see. So they become testimonies to you. They become the witnesses, the testimony. The testif they testify to your holiness as you offer it. They reflect it back at you, and then you know you have it. That's the only way you'll know you have it. You only know you're forgiven when you're forgiven all, and they show the forgiveness in you. You only know love when you love unconditionally, and they show you love, and they love you unconditionally, and you know you have it. They will be happy learners. You will be a happy learner of the lessons this life brings to them because it teaches them release from nothing and from all the works of nothing. You let the world go. You be in the world, not of it, because of it is nothing. The heavy chains that seem to bind them to despair, they do not see as nothing until you bring the light to them. And then they see the chains have disappeared. And so they must have been nothing. And the minute they do that, and you will see it with them because you taught them gladness and release, and they will become your teachers and gladness. They mirror you. When you teach anyone that the truth is true, you learn it with them. You want to know why I do this? There it is. This is why I do this, and I offer it freely, because then it returns to me. And so you learn that what seemed hardest was easiest, giving and receiving on the same. Learn to be a happy learner. Learn to give up this world. You will never learn how to make nothing everything. Give up this illusion. Give up this hallucination. Realize you but look upon yourself with filters that make yourself appear as this world, as other bodies, as this solar system, as this universe. You look upon the light, but through a filter. And that filter makes, makes you see, manifests you see, people, places, things, and events, mountains, rivers, the sky. Yet see that this has been your goal and recognize how foolish you have, it, it's been. Be glad it is undone. When you, when you look at it in simple honesty, it is undone. I said before, be not content with nothing. This is an ancient teaching of Jesus 2,000 years ago. Be you not content with nothing, for you have believed that nothing could content you. It is not so. If you would be a happy learner, you must give everything you learned to the Holy Spirit. Empty your cup to be unlearned for you. Empty your cup. He will remove all those bondages that you've made. And then bring, and then begin to learn the joyous lessons that come quickly on the firm foundation that truth is true. And the truth is within you. What is built there is true and built on truth, and it's in within you. The universe of learning will open up before you in all its gracious simplicity. With truth before you, you will not look back. And that's quite symbolic. You won't look back on the past. You won't look back on what you've made. You let it all go willingly because you're willing replacing illusion with joy. And so you give up nothing. There's no sacrifice. It's a glad exchange. The happy learner meets the conditions of learning here as he meets the conditions of knowledge in the kingdom. In the kingdom, it's full knowledge. Yeah, you prepare yourself knowledge to enter and that's all this course is doing it's preparing you to let go of all the obstacles you've been deposed between yourself and god the veil you've created there's a veil between you and god and that veil which is so thin it's not even real you have decided to make thick in your making manifest and now you're dissolving it all this lies in the holy spirit's plan to free you from the past because that's the problem the minute you ever thought you're in the past immediately and opens up the way to freedom for you. Because all your grievances, all your resistance lies from past. But you say, you experienced it not. You brought the past into the present. And because the past was not joyful, 
you're imagining it's going to happen in the future. So you project it. And so you try to link the past and the future with thoughts of the past in the present. And what do you do? The minute you're in the past, while you appear to be in the present, you're actually in the past. And it's not true. And so what is the world, the universe? A thought you had in the past when you fell asleep. And when you awaken, what do you see the universe as? Pure light. Why? Because the light is always here now as you, as the extension of the love of God. God is light. So what you're looking upon, every time you see an object, you're looking on the past because it was created by our mind as sleep. But truth is true. What else could ever be or ever was? This simple lesson holds the key to the dark door that you believe is locked forever this world you made this door of nothing you made this world of nothing and behind it is nothing except you've given it all sorts of stories the key is the only light the holy spirit is the key is the only light that shines away the shapes and forms and fears of nothing accept this key to freedom from the hands of christ who gives it to you that you may join him in the holy task of bringing light to all. Bringing light, extending light. As the Father extended, you extend. For like your brothers, you do not realize the light has come and freed you from the sleep of darkness. The fact, just the mere fact that you're willing to believe you're dreaming, the light has come. And then then believing and dreaming will be the realization I'm not dreaming anymore. I'm semi sort of dreaming. I'm waking up. Oh, it's morning. Oh, it's light. Oh, I've never left my father's home. Behold your brother in their freedom. Free the world from the bondage, from the grievances, from the blame, from the attack thoughts, from the fact that you believe they've taken something away from you, that someone is prohibiting you from being joyously free no one is it's on your mind and so they become a manifestation of what you believe you're bound to and learn of them how to be free of darkness and set them free so that you can be free too the light in you will wake them those that are willing you can't change everybody because not everybody's at the level you at and so those that are attracted to your light will come to you and those that are fear your light will challenge you and you say no thanks just like a thought no thanks and they will not leave you asleep. The vision of Christ is given the very instant that it is perceived. So you've perceived the world. Now you perceive the lights in you. And the minute you're willing to, here it is. Where everything is clear. It is all holy. Everything. And seen anew, you realize what seemed like a mountain is just light. What seemed like the ocean is just light. What seemed like a body is just light. What seemed like a, a far off place is just like the stars are light, the moon is light, the clouds are light. It's, it's just, I believe they were there. The quietness, simplicity is quiet, stillness. Quiet of its, of its simplicity is so compelling that you will realize it's impossible deny, to deny the simple truth. For there is nothing else. God is everywhere. And you, his son, is in God, in him, with everything. Can he sing the dirge of sorrow when this is true? Can you still be sad when you realize the light has come and you are the light? And you are the light of God. And now you are called to be a light in a dream. A light of space, time, matter, the world. And yet the light has come in your mind and your mind realizes I'm no longer dreaming, although I appear to be a body mind in space time, but I realize time is an illusion, past doesn't exist. I am here now forever in God. I abide in God, God abides in me. And so knowing this, let me be the happy learner. Let me move into the world. Let me be conscious of where I am. And let me not bring fear and damnation and, and horrible stuff. And, you know, let me, let me, let me not talk atonement. Let me demonstrate. At one minute. I hope this brings light to the subject. We're going to stop here and um, do some questions.